Hello, in this video I will cover the blood vessels. As you know, we have three main types of blood vessels in our bodies, arteries, capillaries, and veins. Therefore, I will talk about the main types of arteries, capillaries, and veins inside your body. I will also summarize how these three vessel types differ from each other. Please write down any questions that you have as you watch this video, and you can comment with your questions below, email me your questions, or ask me during our next class. Let's first review the function of the three main blood vessels in your body. Remember, arteries always carry blood away from the heart, and they're carrying them to capillaries. And I always remember this because of A for away. Veins always carry blood towards the heart from the capillaries. And what exactly are capillaries? Well, capillaries are very, very tiny blood vessels that connect the arteries to the veins. And they are the sites of nutrients and waste exchange between the blood and the tissues. So you have capillaries, for example, inside your surrounding your lungs that are exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide between the air in your lungs and the blood. And then you also have capillaries surrounding most of the tissues inside your body where there's exchange of waste and gases and nutrients and so forth. Now, one important question I have for you is, do all arteries contain oxygenated blood? Now, this is a misconception that many students have. Many students think that arteries always have oxygenated blood, but that is not true. All arteries carry blood away from the heart, and that is what they all share. However, there are some arteries in your body that actually carry deoxygenated blood. For example, the two that you learned are the pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary trunk. These arteries carry deoxygenated blood from your heart to your lungs. There are different types of circulatory systems that can exist in different living organisms. Humans have what we call a closed circulatory system. But in order to understand what this means, let's look at what it means to have an open circulatory system. So a lot of organisms, mostly invertebrates like insects and stuff like that, they have what's called an open circulatory system. An open circulatory system has a heart pump, so you can see the heart here, but the circulatory fluid comes in direct contact with all the tissues. So the fluid that's being circulated through the body is actually coming in direct contact with their tissue cells. They do not have blood vessels that contain all of their circulatory fluid, and therefore they can't maintain blood pressure. Whereas in a closed circulatory system, the circulatory fluid, and we call this blood, is restricted to blood vessels. And this allows an organism to actually maintain a certain type of pressure within those vessels. And this also enables them to grow larger because now there's more pressure in these blood vessels so that the blood can travel further um, throughout the body. You can see that here. So even an earthworm actually has a closed circulatory system. So here's the heart and the heart pumps the circulatory fluid through blood vessels and then that returns to the heart. And the same thing occurs in humans. Now we're going to look at the three layers or tunics that form the blood vessel walls. Arteries and veins have three tunics. The innermost is called the tunica intima. Then we have the tunica media, and the most external is called the tunica externa. Capillaries, on the other hand, only have one thin inner layer. And this thin inner layer consists of what's called the endothelium. And surrounding that is a connective tissue layer called the basement membrane. You can see that in purple here. All blood vessels have a lumen, and the lumen is just a word that's describing the passageway or space within the blood vessel where the blood flows. On this slide, we're going to look at the function and composition of the three layers of the vessel wall. Let's start with the tunica intima. This is the innermost layer. It's very permeable. It also has a lipid coating on it that repels formed elements in the blood, and this is important because it helps to prevent clotting. Its composition includes endothelium, 
which is a cell layer that comes in contact with the blood itself. And then surrounding the endothelium, we have what's called the basement membrane. It helps to support the endothelium and it also helps to connect the tunica intima to other tissues. The middle layer of the blood vessel wall is called the tunica media. It's responsible for vasoconstricting, so making the vessel smaller, diameter smaller, or vasodilating or making it wider. Therefore, it can alter blood pressure. The smaller the blood vessel, the higher the blood pressure. The more a blood vessel dilates, the lower the blood pressure. What is the tunica media composed of? Well, in order to be able to constrict or dilate the blood vessels, it's got to be made up of smooth muscles, and that's what allows it to do that. It also does have some collagen and elastic fibers for support and elasticity. Then our outermost layer, the tunica externa, it functions in anchoring vessels to other tissues or vessels. It also provides a passageway for sympathetic nerves and small blood vessels to actually enter the vessel walls. And these tiny little blood vessels that are in the tunica externa are called the vasa vasorum. And okay, we'll talk about that a little bit more um, here in this next little section. So what is the tunica externa composed of? It's composed of loose connective tissue. That's what allows it to attach to other tissues. It also is composed of a lot of elastic and collagen fiber for support and elasticity. And one of the most important things that I want you to know about the tunica externa are these blood vessels that are outside of there. They're called again, the vasa vasorum, which means vessels of vessels. So the larger blood vessels in your body, they're so large that it's hard for them to get the nutrients and stuff they need from the blood that's moving through them. So instead, they actually have to have a tiny little blood vessels on the outside of the larger vessels that are embedded in the tunica externa that help to supply nutrients to the wall of the larger vessels. Now let's test your understanding of some of the terms we just covered. What you want to do is match each of these terms with the correct description. So vessels that carry blood towards the heart, those are going to be called veins. The space in a blood vessel that contains the blood, that is called the lumen. Tiny blood vessels that exchange material between the blood and tissues, that would be called capillaries. Tiny blood vessels that supply nutrients to the wall of large blood vessels, that would be the vasa vasorum, vessels of vessels. Vessels that carry blood away from the heart, Remember, A, away, so that would be the arteries. The layer of the vessel wall composed of endothelium and basement membrane. That would be the innermost layer, the tunica intima. The outer layer of the vessel wall would be the tunica externa. The layer of the vessel wall that contains a lot of smooth muscle would be the tunica media. I always remember M for muscle, middle for muscle. The type of circulatory system with a heart pump and where circulatory fluid is contained within vessels. Therefore, it can maintain blood pressure. This would be a closed circulatory system. What about the type of circulatory system that has a heart pump, but the circulatory fluid comes in direct contact with the tissues? This would be an open circulatory system. Humans, again, we have a closed circulatory system. Now let's look at some of the differences between arteries and veins. So just looking at this picture, do you see some major differences here? One thing that I notice is that the tunica media seems to be like the thickest layer of the arteries. Whereas when we look at a vein, it looks like the tunica externa is its thickest layer. Another thing that I notice here is that there's a lot more elastic fibers which are shown in blue in an artery than there are in a vein. Elastic fibers are, you can think of it like a rubber band. So when a rubber band stretches, it has a lot of elasticity. So when you let go, it goes back to its original shape. What this means is that when an artery stretches, it can easily go back to its original shape because it has a lot of elasticity. 
whereas a vein can't really do that. Another thing I just want to point out to you um, that we talked about in the last slide are the blood vessels in the tunica externa. So here you can actually see the vasa vasorum, these blood vessels out here that are helping to supply nutrients to the layers of the blood vessel wall. Arteries maintain their shape better and have thicker walls. Why is that? So here you can see an artery. It looks like a perfect little circle whereas the vein looks like it's been stretched out and it looks kind of flattened here. Well, arteries have to have a thicker wall because they are exposed to higher blood pressures than veins. And this makes sense because arteries are receiving blood directly from the heart. So every time the heart pumps, it pushes a whole lot of pressure into the arteries. So every time the heart pumps, the arteries kind of expand to try to compensate for this increase in pressure. And they have to be able to then go back to their original shape. So we call arteries resistance vessels because they're resilient against blood pressure. However, if you look at a vein, you'll notice that the wall is very thin and it's more flaccid, which means it's more floppy. And why is that? Well, veins are usually exposed to very low blood pressure. By the time the blood actually enters the veins, it's usually so far away from the heart that there's very little blood pressure remaining there. So we call veins capacitance vessels because they can, although they can't really withstand a lot of blood pressure, they can easily kind of just stretch out and stay stretched. So they easily accommodate high volumes of blood. And so they actually, most of the blood in your body at any given time is in your veins. It's just kind of being stored in your veins because there's not a lot of blood pressure to keep it moving through the veins. Okay, so if we were to summarize the differences between the arteries and veins, this is a great table to look at. I recommend printing out this table and studying from it. Arteries, again, are called resistance vessels. Veins are called capacitance vessels because they have a large capacity to hold blood. Let's talk about the direction of flow. Remember, arteries direct blood away from the heart and veins direct blood towards the heart. We talk about the general wall thickness here. Arteries have a thicker wall they, because they need to resist the blood pressure surges um, because they're closer to the heart. Whereas veins tend to have thinner walls um, because they don't really have to deal with a lot of blood pressure. However, by having thinner walls, it allows them to expand to hold more blood. And therefore, one thing, one consequence of this is that veins will actually collapse if there's no blood in them. And you saw that in that last picture. What about what is the thickest tunic of the arteries? Do you remember? The thickest tunic is the tunica media. This is the muscle layer. And this is really important because arteries tend to be able to change their vessel diameter. So they need to have a lot of muscle to be able to change the diameter of their lumens. Whereas in veins, their thickest tunic is a tunica externa. So they actually have a lot less muscle. Um, so they don't really have a lot of control over their diameter. What about the lumen diameter size? So in arteries, the lumen diameter, so that's the, the amount of space within the blood vessels, is a lot narrower. Um, this creates more resistance to help maintain blood pressure. Whereas veins, their lumen or the space within them is actually a lot wider usually. And again, this is because veins tend to hold a lot more blood at a given time than arteries. So this actually allows your veins to be what we call the blood reservoirs in your body. They actually are holding, again, most of the blood in your body at a given time. What about the amount of elastic and collagen fibers in their tunics? Which has more, arteries or veins? Well, arteries are gonna have a lot more. And remember, these having more elasticity means that whenever they stretch, they'll come back to be their original shape. And this is really important in arteries because arteries are constantly being exposed to surges of blood pressure. So every time they get the heart pumps, an artery is going to stretch, but then it's going to be able to go back to its original shape. Veins, on the other hand, have a lot less elasticity to them. 
So they can't maintain their shape very well, but they can expand very easily. So they'll expand and fill with blood and then they'll kind of just stay stretched and um, they won't really be able to go back and go back to their original shape. So looking at these pictures, one thing that you can notice here, each of these pictures here is showing a vein and an artery running along each other. And this is very common in your body because the artery is usually carrying blood towards the tissues and then the veins are carrying it away from the tissues and they're kind of parallel to each other. So which of these is an artery and which is a vein? The top one is a vein and the bottom one is an artery. And you can tell that because again, the vein has a thinner wall overall and the artery has a much thicker wall and a smaller lumen, that's the space in here, whereas the vein's lumen is a lot larger. It can hold a lot more blood at a given time. Over here, the same thing, which is an artery, which is a vein. There's our vein and there's our artery. Notice how the artery is able to maintain its shape very well. It has this nice circular shape, whereas a vein tends to become stretched and is flattened when there's no blood inside of it. Now we're going to talk about how we can classify vessels further. Arteries and veins tend to be classified based on their relative size and the composition of their tunic walls. Notice that the vessel size decreases as you move further from the heart. And that's the same for arteries and veins. Or in other words, as you get closer to the heart, the vessel diameter gets larger. Capillaries, on the other hand, when we try to classify them, we're going to be classifying them based on their level of permeability, so how easily stuff can go in and out of them. So let's look at arteries first. The largest arteries in your body are called the elastic or conductant arteries, and these are the ones that are closest to your heart. Now they're very elastic, which means again that they can expand and recoil very easily. And that's going to be really important because since they're so close to your heart, they experience greater surges of blood pressure. So we like to think of elastic arteries as having what's called a pressure smoothing effect. So they keep blood flow continuous and prevent pressure surges that would otherwise occur from the pumping of the heart. The second largest um, arteries in your body are called the muscular or distributing arteries. So these are medium sized arteries and they have a relatively thick muscle layer. This relatively thick muscle layer here, since it's composed of smooth muscles, it allows them to vasoconstrict and vasodilate to regulate your blood pressure. And remember this relationship. When you increase vasoconstriction, so when the blood vessel gets smaller or narrower, that's going to increase blood pressure. It's going to increase the resistance to the flow of blood, and therefore it's going to decrease the flow or speed of blood. The smallest arteries in your body are called arterioles or resistance arteries. These are the arteries that are going to lead directly to the capillaries. Arterioles can also vasoconstrict and vasodilate, and this allows the arterioles to determine which capillaries receive more or less blood flow at a given time. Here you can see a large artery very close up, so this is actually showing the wall of the aorta, the largest artery you have in your body. And you can notice all the elastic fibers within the wall of the aorta. Here is a medium muscular artery next to a vein. Notice how thick the muscle layer is here and notice how well it maintains its shape. Here is a really close up of an arterial, the smallest artery. So it actually has a very, very thin wall to it. There are some smooth muscles there and you can just tell how thin this wall is because you can see the individual blood cell, red blood cells within this arterial. One really important clinical application associated with arteries is something called atherosclerosis. A, an atheroma means plaque and sclerosis, this word means hardening. So this is hardening of the blood vessel wall due to a buildup of plaque. And so 
plaque usually builds up, which is plaque is usually a mixture of like fat and cholesterol and other types of molecules as well. But these molecules build up inside of the layer between the tunica intima right here and the tunica media. And so you have this buildup of plaque in here. This hardens and narrows the blood vessel. And again, since you're narrowing the blood vessel, this reduces the size of the vessels, restricts blood flow, increases blood, uh, blood pressure, and also increases the risk of clots forming, especially if for some reason the endothelium, the inner wall, the tunica intima actually ruptures, and then some of that black plaque comes out, and then what that does is prevent blood flow, and that can lead to a clot forming. Atherosclerosis is very common within the coronary arteries, and that can cause blockage within the coronary arteries, which could lead to a heart attack. Um, if you want to click on a link to this video, I will put it in the description below, and you can actually look at how damaged endothelium can lead to a blood clot. Another arterial disorder that is very common and you probably heard of is what's called an aneurysm. An aneurysm is when a portion of the artery wall actually becomes weakened over time. And this causes that portion of the arterial wall to actually bulge out because of the high amount of pressure that's going through those blood vessels. This forms a balloon-like sac, and this sac will actually pulsate every time the pressure increases from the heart pumping within the artery. And this becomes can become dangerous, especially if you have like a brain aneurysm, which you can see here, because that can put pressure on the tissues that, sur that are surrounding that blood vessel. And it can become really deadly if this aneurysm actually ruptures. If it ruptures, that can produce fatal hemorrhaging or lead to a stroke if it's happening within the brain. Um, the most common cause of an aneurysm is actually a combination of having narrowed blood vessels because we know that that can increase um, blood pressure. So atherosclerosis can lead to that, plus having hypertension. Hypertension is chronic elevated blood pressure. Both of these together, narrow, narrowing blood vessels and chronic high blood pressure lead to weakening of your arteries and can lead to a higher risk of aneurysms forming. About 10 million people have a brain aneurysm in the United States each year, and about 15,000 people uh, die actually from their aneurysms. There are ways to treat an aneurysm, and I will also put the link to this video below if you're kind of curious how you can actually um, treat an aneurysm and prevent it from worsening. As we know, arteries lead to capillaries, and capillaries are the sites of exchange of nutrients and waste between the blood and the tissues themselves. You actually have three different types of capillaries within your body. So we're gonna have to talk about those different types of capillaries. We're gonna talk a little bit about capillary beds and their importance, um, about the different types of circulatory routes that can lead to and from capillary beds, and then we'll talk a little bit about how exactly capillary exchange happens. So again, your three types of capillaries are classified based on their permeability. So how easily stuff can move in and out of the blood. Um, remember, capillaries must be leaky to allow for exchange of gases and solutes between the blood and the surrounding tissues. So if we want to classify your capillaries based on least permeable to most permeable, that is what this diagram is showing. So the least permeable capillaries are called the continuous capillaries. Let's just explore the picture here a little bit. What you can see here are the two member capillaries only have the tunica intima, the innermost layer, and that is composed of the endothelial cells here and a basement membrane surrounding that. Notice the endothelial cells are pretty close to each other. There is a tiny little gap there called the intercellular cleft. So some really tiny molecules can get through between the endothelial cells. Um, the basement membrane is very is continuous. 
along the entire thing. And things can move in and out of the basement membrane. Think of this as kind of like a little, like very tiny mesh, okay? So stuff can easily kind of get through the basement membrane. The next most permeable capillary type are fenestrated capillaries. Fenestrations are holes. So if you look here, you can see the basement membrane is continuous, but there are holes or little windows or fenestrations in the actual endothelial cells. And this allows for increased permeability. So now like more fluid can easily get in and out and maybe even some larger molecules. And then our most perme permeable capillaries are the sinusoids. Look at just how many gaps there are in these capillaries. So they first off, they have an incomplete basement membrane that allows for really large things to get through. Uh, they also have very, very large intercellular gaps allowing for very large things to get through. Even things as large as other cells can get through the sinusoids. So this is a table, again, that you want to study thoroughly because it really helps show the differences between the different types of capillaries. So let's look at continuous capillaries first and summarize their kind of their importance here. So they're continuous. Um, they have a continuous tube of endothelial cells with little spaces between the cells called intercellular clefts. Because there's only little gaps there, they only allow passage of small solutes such as gases, glucose, amino acids, and ions. So you want to know what type of molecules could get through a continuous capillary. So where are these usually found? Well, this is the most common type of capillary in your body. So all your vascularized organs, this includes your skin, muscles, central nervous system, all of them have continuous capillaries. Fenestrated capillaries, let's look at them. So we've talked about these already in the last slide, but they have a continuous tube of endothelial cells. You can see that here. Their basement membranes also continuous, but they have tiny pores in the membranes of the endothelial cells called fenestrations. Again, this means little windows or pores. So they're gonna allow slightly larger molecules to go through like small proteins. And it's also going to allow the passage of large amounts of fluid. So where are they going to be found? Well, they're going to be found in areas where you're going to need a lot of fluid exchange and maybe even a lot of exchange of proteins between the blood and the tissues. Can you think of some places where that might be needed? Um, well, some places that you will find fenestrated capillaries include the small intestines because you're absorbing a lot of nutrients into the blood from your small intestines. They're also found in the ciliary bodies of your eyes. Remember, ciliary bodies of your eyes make aqueous fluid in the front of your eyes. So you're making a whole bunch of fluid that has to leave the blood. So that's why they're there. The choroid plexuses make cerebral spinal fluid in your brain. So they're going to be making a whole, filtering out a whole lot of fluid from the blood. So um, your kidneys are also processing or exchanging a lot of fluid. So you're gonna have fenestrated capillaries there. And some endocrine glands are going to have fenestrated capillaries. Endocrine glands we know make hormones and most hormones are proteins. So in order for them to enter the blood, you're gonna need slightly bigger openings than what you would find in a continuous capillary. Sinusoids, as if you remember, they are discontinuous. So they have an incomplete basement membrane, very large intercellular clefts. So they're going to allow really large things to get through. These things include large proteins and even cells. These could include stem cells or blood cells. So where might you need to see a movement of large proteins or cells between the blood and the tissues? Well, one great example of this would be the bone marrow. Remember, your bone marrow is making all of the formed elements in your blood. So in order for those formed elements to make it into your blood, they're going to, they're going to move through sinusoid capillaries. Your liver and spleen are responsible for breaking down old platelets and old red blood cells. So in order for those red blood cells and platelets to actually enter the liver and the spleen tissue, they're going to have to exit through sinusoids. 
And then some endocrine glands make really large hormones, so they would have sinusoids so that the large proteins can easily enter the blood to be circulated throughout the body. All right, so let's test your knowledge on the capillaries. So pick which type of capillary matches each description. So this type of capillary has an incomplete discontinuous basement membrane and large gaps between cells. This would be the sinusoids. This type of capillary has a complete basement membrane. Molecules move through narrow intercellular clefts. This would be the continuous capillaries. This type of capillary has a complete basement membrane and solutes move through holes or pores in the endothelial cells. That would be the fenestrated capillaries. This is the most common type of capillary in your body. It's found in all vascularized tissue and it only allows small solutes to move or be exchanged. That would be the continuous capillaries. This type of capillary is commonly found in the ciliary body of the eyes, kidneys, intestines, and some endocrine glands. These locations require the movement of a lot of fluid and small proteins. That would be the fenestrated capillaries. And then finally, this type of capillary is commonly found in the liver, spleen, bone marrow, and some endocrine glands. These locations require the movement of large proteins and or cells into or out of the blood. That would be the sinusoids. Capillaries usually form what are called capillary beds. And these are networks of capillaries formed around tissues. Here you can see an arterial that branches into a met arterial and the met arterial links the arterioles to the capillary beds. One important feature of the met arterioles are these structures here called the precapillary sphincters. These muscle cells can open or close, so they can constrict and close or relax and open. And whenever they're open, they allow blood to flow into the capillary beds. And whenever they're closed, blood cannot flow into the capillary beds. And this is really important because this allows your body to regulate which capillary beds are open or closed. So for example, whenever you're exercising, you're going to want to open up the capillary beds to your skeletal muscles. And however, when you're resting, those capillary beds may be closed because you don't actually need to be supplying as much nutrients to those skeletal muscles. Now let's talk about the different routes that blood can take through or around capillary beds. So we call these circulatory routes. The most simple pathway that blood could take to a capillary bed and then back to the heart is called the simple pathway. And this is when you have a single artery that feeds a capillary bed and then you have a single vein that carries the blood away and back to the heart. An example of this would be to and from your spleen. You just have a single artery carrying the blood to your spleen and then a single vein carrying the blood away from your spleen. Another type of circulatory route is called anastomoses. And this is when you have two or more vessels that merge before or after a capillary bed. You can have something called an arterial anastomosis. So here you can see there's a bunch of arteries that are merging together before this capillary bed. And then there's only one vein carrying it away. Down here, you can see what we call a venous anastomosis. So you only have a single artery supplying the capillary bed, but you can see that the veins kind of diverge and so forth after the capillary bed. One of the benefits of an anastomosis is it provides alternative, or in other words, collateral routes for blood supply. So let's just say that, for example, right here, this artery becomes blocked. Well, because you have these other routes here, the blood can still make it to the capillary bed, and that's going to be very be beneficial. One place where you have an anastomosis is called the circle of Willis in your brain. So in the inferior portion of your brain, you actually have these arterial anastomoses so that if one of the arteries becomes blocked, you will still have blood supply to your brain. 
in the veins of your leg that return blood up to your heart, you actually have a lot of venous anastomoses there. So if one vein becomes blocked or obstructed or something, you still can have blood return to your heart. This is really important because actually, whenever they do coronary bypass surgery, they usually actually remove a vein from your leg and will use that to um, direct blood around a blocked coronary artery. And they can do that because removing a single vein from your leg is not going to prevent blood flow black back to your heart. You also have a lot of uh, um, arterial anastomoses in your hand. So there's a lot of merging and branching of the blood vessels in your hand to supply your fingertips. Another type of anastomosis, this is a special type, called, is called an arteriovenous anastomosis. So it is actually, um, another term for that is a shunt. And you can see that here. So sometimes whenever you don't need blood supply to a certain capillary bed, the blood will be diverged on into a shunt. So this is where an artery directly connects to a vein and it bypasses a capillary. This, for example, happens in your fingers and your toes. So when it's really cold outside, the blood will actually bypass your fingertips and will not go to the capillaries there and it will actually be shunted away from the fingertips. The fourth type of circulatory system is called a portal system and this is something we've already actually talked about before. So this is when blood flows through two capillary beds before returning to the heart and you can see an image of that down here. So the blood is flowing through this one capillary bed and it might be feeding a certain amount of tissues there. Then it's going to travel to a second capillary bed surrounding another type of group of tissues before it returns back to the heart. And you, there's uh, two examples here um, of a portal system. One is the hypophyseal portal system. This is between the hypothalamus and anterior pituitary. Remember, the hypothalamus produces hormones that enter the blood, and then tra that those hormones travel to capillary beds that surround the anterior pituitary, and those hormones then leave the blood enter the anterior pituitary and then affect the release or inhibition of certain hormones in the anterior pituitary. You also have another really important portal system called the hepatic portal system, which we'll talk about a lot when we talk about digestion. And this is a portal system between your digestive tract and your liver. So pretty much all nutrients that is absorbed by the digestive tract, except for lipids, is actually transported to capillary beds in the liver. Your liver then processes that nutrients before it is sent throughout your body. So here is showing some illustrations of arterial anastomoses in the bottom of the brain and in the hand. Here you can see how um, there is a arteriovenous anastomosis in the fingertips or shunts that are preventing blood flow to go from the, to the fingertips. So it's bypassing those capillaries. And here is an illustration of the hypophyseal portal system. So here are capillaries that are surrounding the hypothalamus, and then they lead to another set of capillaries surrounding the anterior pituitary. All right, let's do a little bit of practice. So use the terms to the right to match um, each description. So blood arrives at a capillary bed via a single artery and exits through a single vein. This is an example of a simple pathway. Blood flows through a capillary bed surrounding the digestive tract and then flows through a second capillary bed in the liver before returning to the heart. This is an example of a portal system. Let's look at number three. These are small vessels that link arterioles to capillaries and they contain smooth muscles that form precapillary sphincters. These would be met arterioles. When multiple arteries connect with each other before reaching a capillary bed, we call this an arterial anastomosis. Blood can bypass capillary beds by moving through this circulatory route, which connects the artery directly to the vein. 
This would be called an arteriovenous anastomosis, or in other words, a shunt. And then number six, this um, removing the saphenous vein from the leg does not stop the flow of blood back to the heart because of what circulatory route? This would be because of the presence of venous anastomoses in your leg. The final topic that we are going to talk about that is associated with capillaries is capillary exchange. So this is the movement of fluid and solutes across the capillary walls into and out of the interstitial space. So this is how, again, substances and fluids move between the blood and the tissues. So there's actually three different types of capillary exchange. The first is called diffusion. This is the movement of small solutes down their concentration gradient. So one thing that drives the movement of solutes in or out of the blood is based on simply their concentration gradients on either side of the membrane. So for example, this is showing an air space in your lungs because the blood approaching your lungs has a lot more carbon dioxide than the air in your lungs. Carbon dioxide leaves your blood and enters the air in your lungs to be exhaled. This blood that's going to your lungs is deoxygenated, so it doesn't have, it's very oxygen poor. And so there's actually more oxygen in your the air sacs in your lungs than in your blood, so the oxygen just simply diffuses into your blood. And this is how the pulmonary circuit works. It picks up oxygen at the lungs and it gives off carbon dioxide. The second type of capillary exchange is called transcytosis. This means through the cell. Okay, so let's, uh, this is how usually larger molecules can move um, across the blood vessel wall, the capillary wall. And it's going to do this by using vesicles. And vesicles are simply just little sacs. You can think of them as like tiny little cell membranes surrounding some type of fluid or some type of solute. Okay, so here is the blood vessel lumen. So imagine this is the inside the capillary up here. This is the interstitial space. So this is the tissue um, over here. Well, let's just say we need to get these large particles out of the blood into the interstitial space. Well, they're too large to actually squeeze through the cell membranes. They're too large to fit between the cells. So what the cell has to do then is the cell membrane of the endothelial cells will surround the particles. It'll break off into a little vesicle. That vesicle will move through the endothelial cell and then it will fuse with the other side and release the particle to the other side. And that is what transcytosis is. The final way um, that molecules can move and fluid can move across a capillary wall is through bulk flow. And this is the mass movement of fluids and solutes in or out of the capillaries. When we look at the arterial end of a capillary, the main direction of fluid and solutes is out of the capillaries and we call this filtration okay so a lot of fluid leaves the capillaries at the arterial end and then most of that fluid is actually going to be absorbed or reabsorbed into the capillaries at the venual end so you have filtration and absorption these are both examples of bulk flow mass movements of fluid one other thing that I want to emphasize here is that diffusion can occur through a couple different means. For example, diffusion again is the movement of small solutes down their concentration gradient. This can happen through fenestration pores, so little pores actually in the um, membranes of the endothelium. Um, they can also move through the phospholipids of the cell membrane. So here you can see it's actually moving through the cell membranes themselves. Um, another way diffusion can occur is actually between the intercellular clefts, so, or within the intercellular clefts, so between the cells, and it can move through. Here you can see transcytosis, an illustration of that occurring. 
Now let's gain a better understanding of the two different types of bulk flow. So bulk flow, again, is the mass movement of fluids and solutes in or out of the capillaries. Now there's two types of bulk flow, filtration and reabsorption. Filtration is the movement of solutes out of the capillaries and into the interstitial space. This is going to occur primarily at the arterial end of the capillary bed. Why does this happen? This happens because there is a greater amount of blood pressure at this end of the capillary bed than at this end here. So this great amount of blood pressure, which we also call hydrostatic pressure, causes fluid to move out of the capillaries. At the venule end over here, most of the fluid is actually pulled back into the capillaries. That's the net movement of fluid. So we call that reabsorption. And this is due to the fact that the blood pressure has decreased a lot. And instead, you have a greater colloid osmotic pressure at this end. So remember, the colloid osmotic pressure has to do with the amount of proteins in the blood. And remember, that pulls fluid into the capillaries. So since the colloid osmotic pressure over here is greater than the blood pressure, there's a greater force pulling fluid back into the capillaries. This is really important because you don't want all the fluid to leave and start filling up the interstitial space. That would lower your blood pressure. That would cause what we call an edema, right, when fluid builds up in the tissues. So you actually need to have a balance between filtration and absorption. Okay, so remember, there's two opposing forces that determine the direction of bulk flow. These, this is the hydrostatic pressure or the blood pressure and the colloid osmotic pressure. So remember, the hydrostatic pressure or blood pressure is a physical force exerted out by the fluid in the capillaries due to the blood pressure itself. Hydrostatic pressure decreases as it moves from the arterial to the venous end. So if you look over here, here's the blood pressure. It's 30 millimeters of mercury over here. On this side, you can see the blood pressure has decreased to 15. And the pressure or hydrostatic pressure out here in the tissues is pretty much non-existent. Okay, so there's no really force pushing fluid into the blood vessel. So it's really only the blood pressure inside the vessel that's kind of forcing fluid out. Okay, and again, it's greater on the arterial end than it is at the venous end. The colloid osmotic pressure, remember this is the force pulling water into the vessels due to the concentration of proteins. And since the concentration of proteins doesn't change as you move along um, the capillary, the, notice that the os colloid osmotic pressure stays the same. It's 21 over here and it's 21 over here. So that's the kind of like, I like to think of it as the pull, the force pulling stuff back into the capillaries. So filtration happens on this end of the capillaries because the hydrostatic pressure is exceeding the colloid osmotic pressure, right? So the blood pressure is 30, the colloid osmotic pressure is 21, so there's a net force pushing the fluid out. Reabsorption happens at the venous end because the colloid osmotic pressure here is greater than the blood pressure. So there is a net force pulling the fluid back into the blood vessels. So again, this is really important because if you remember what we talked about before, if you don't have enough proteins in your blood, your osmotic pressure is too low to pull the fluid back in and that can lead to an edema and lead to fluid building up outside of your blood vessels. In association with this, I need to bring up something that's important that we'll talk about actually in our next lecture in class, and that is the role of lymph the lymphatic system in reabsorption. Your capillaries are capable of reabsorbing about 85% of the fluid that they filter out. Okay, so you can see that here. So this is showing arterial blood flow. It's going through this capillary bed here about 85% of the interstitial fluid is going to be returned to the blood and then it's going to go through the veins. However, 
15% of that fluid is kind of just staying in the interstitial space and it's not being reabsorbed. This is where the lymphatic system comes in. The lymphatic system will um, consist of a network of vessels and these vessels will actually take up the other 15% of that interstitial fluid. And so they'll reabsorb any excess interstitial fluid that needs to be reabsorbed. That fluid will flow through various structures called lymph nodes, which help to filter that fluid out. And then that fluid will be returned to your veins and returned to your circulatory system. All right, so now that we've talked about the three types of capillary exchange, let's summarize all that information on one table. So again, a great table to study. So the three types of capillary exchange are diffusion, transcytosis, and bulk flow. So diffusion is the movement of small solutes down their concentration gradient. The types of substances that are exchanged are usually small substances such as oxygen, carbon dioxide, small lipids, glucose, electrolytes like sodium, potassium, and so forth. How are these molecules exchanged between the blood and the tissues? Well, the solutes pass between the molecules of the plasma membrane. They can fit through filtration pores, which we call fenestrations, and or they can actually move between the cells in those little spaces that we call the intercellular clefts. The second type of capillary exchange is transcytosis. So when you think of transcytosis, think of vesicles, okay? So these are little fluid-filled sacs that allow larger substances such as fatty acids and proteins like albumin and insulin to move between the blood and the interstitial space. How are these molecules exchanged? These macromolecules, or in other words, large molecules, are captured in vesicles on one side of the cell, then they're drawn across the cell and ejected on the other side. The third type of capillary exchange is bulk flow. This is the mass movement of large amounts of fluid in or out of the capillaries and also moving with the fluid or smaller solutes. Um, the direction that the fluid moves, whether it's in or out of the capillaries, is determined by the hydrostatic pressure and the colloid osmotic pressure. So which one is greater determines, all, determines which way the fluid moves. So the types of substances that are exchanged are large amounts of fluids and again, solutes as well. And how do these molecules move? So when we're talking about filtration, the molecules or the movement of the fluid and the solutes is out of the capillaries and into the interstitial space. This again occurs at the arterial end of the capillaries and is due to there being a, hydro, hydro, a higher hydrostatic or blood pressure at that end. Reabsorption is going to be occurring at the venous end and that is due to the pool of fluid and solutes into the capillaries because of a higher colloid osmotic pressure at that end. All right, let's test your understanding here of the different types of capillary or terminology associated with capillary exchange. So this moves substances across the endothelial cells using vesicles. Vesicles is the key word here. It is transcytosis. This moves small solutes across the endothelial cells, always down their concentration gradient. This would be diffusion. This type of movement is driven by the balance between hydrostatic or blood pressure and colloid osmotic pressure. Examples of this type of movement include filtration and reabsorption. This is bulk flow. The blank is a force that pulls fluid into the blood at the venule end of capillaries. That would be the colloid osmotic pressure. The blank is a force that pushes fluid into the interstitial space at the arterial end of capillaries. That would be the hydrostatic pressure or the blood pressure. This type of bulk flow occurs at the arterial end of capillaries. So what type of bulk flow occurs at the arterial end? That would be filtration. 
This type of bulk flow occurs at the venous end of capillaries. That would be reabsorption because it gets filtered out at one end and then it gets reabsorbed at the other. The last major group of vessels that we're going to be talking about are veins. And you could probably categorize the type of veins into more detail than we're going to, but we're just going to kind of break them up into two major groups here. Venules are the smallest veins. They receive blood directly from the capillary beds. And then we have medium-sized veins, which then become larger veins as we get closer to the heart. So medium-sized and large veins return blood to the heart. Those inferior to the heart usually have valves present. And these venous valves prevent the backflow of blood and prevent blood from pooling in your legs. And um, this is kind of necessary. Your, your large veins need these venous valves because there's such a small amount of blood pressure in your veins. And so there's not enough pressure to continually push the blood forward towards your heart. Your veins need to have several different mechanisms to promote the unidirectional flow of blood towards the heart, okay, because there's not a lot of blood pressure in there. So let's list some of the mechanisms that your body uses to keep blood flowing in the correct direction through your veins. One is simply your blood pressure, okay? Although the blood pressure in veins is low, it still does there's still some blood pressure there and it still directs blood flow towards the heart. Okay, so it's still pushing blood a little bit towards the heart. Second, gravity helps move blood towards your heart only when we're talking about the veins above your heart. So for example, all the veins in my head, they can simply use gravity to drain the blood back towards my heart. Third is what we call skeletal pumping, and that's illustrated to the right. So when we're talking about blood flow or through your veins and your legs, if you didn't, if you're not moving around, the blood kind of pulls down towards your feet. However, when you're moving or you're exercising, the muscle contractions from when, whenever these skeletal muscles contract, it actually squeezes your veins and help push the blood up towards your heart and so any blood that moves up won't be able to flow back down towards your feet because of these valves present these valves close to kind of keep the blood moving in one direction okay so this blood would move up the valves would close and prevent it from coming back down Another thing that's kind of a little bit more, I think, complex to visual or difficult to visualize is this thoracic or respiratory pump. Pretty much what you just want to know here is that when you're breathing, every time you take a deep breath in or out, the pressure changes in your thoracic cavity and your abdominal cavity help to pull blood up towards your heart. Okay, so it's almost like you're creating this suction and it's pulling the blood up from your lower veins up into your heart, um, towards your heart. The last thing that helps to bring blood towards the heart is just what we call cardiac suction. So this suction is actually created by the atria when they expand or relax. This sucks the blood into the heart from the veins. And a great example of that is one of these little basters here. So I have a little bit of blood, actually it's just tea in this little cup. And when I squeeze this, you could think of it as the atria contracting. And imagine this is a vein, like this is the vena cava, okay, going into the right atrium. So whenever the right atrium relaxes, you can see that it's pulling blood towards the heart, okay? So every time that the atria relax, it helps to suck blood into the heart itself, okay, through the veins. One thing that many of us hate or hope that we never get, or maybe we, we have some of these, are varicose veins. Uh, varicose veins are veins that you know, become visible on your legs, and they usually look like these dark purple squiggles um, on, your, on your, a lot of times people get them on their lower legs. And this is because these veins have become distended or stretched over time. And whenever, 
a this is a normal vein here. You can see how the valves can close and prevent blood from pooling. However, whenever a vein becomes stretched over time, the valves become deformed. They can no longer close and blood starts pooling in the veins. When that happens, it causes the veins to start becoming all coiled and distended um, and it makes them very visible on the outside because now they're just filled with blood and they're not able to actually promote the movement of blood back towards the heart. Uh, this is more common in your superficial veins. So these are the veins closest to your skin because you don't have the skeletal pumping there to help constrict and move the blood up towards your heart. Some risk factors associated with this would be jobs involving prolonged standing because if you're just standing all the time, like just say you're working as a cashier, then what's happening is blood is constantly pooling in your legs, pooling in those veins and causing them to distend. Ob obesity as well as pregnancy or large amounts of weight gain can also lead to an increased risk of the formation of varicose veins because you have um, you're again, less skeletal pumping. In the case of pregnancy, your blood volume increases during pregnancy as well. So you just have more pooling of blood in your veins. Hemorrhoids are actually just varicose veins of the anal canal. So here's, um, you can see a hemorrhoid here, and it's just a vein that has become stretched out and distended to the point where it can no longer maintain, you know, the movement of blood flow in one direction easily. Now that we've talked in detail about the different types of blood vessels, let's talk about the major differences between the arteries, veins, and capillaries. One thing that's really different about them is the total blood volume in each vessel type at any given time. So just looking here, let's, let's look at where is the blood right now in your body, okay, at any given moment. About 12% 12, 12 of the blood is in your heart, 18% of the blood is moving through your pulmonary circulation. And 70% of your blood is moving through the systemic circulation. 10% of that 70% is actually within your systemic arteries. 5% of that blood is in your systemic capillaries. And 55% of the blood in your systemic circulation is in your veins. So again, most of your blood at any given time is within your veins. And this is why we call your veins your blood reservoirs. Veins are able to hold a lot of blood because they can easily expand to hold the blood. There's also a very low blood pressure in your veins, so this prevents the blood from moving through very quickly. If we look at vessel diameter, you can see here, so this is showing the vessel diameter on this axis. Here we're seeing the different vessel types. And we can see that elastic arteries have a very large vessel diameter. And then as we move towards the capillaries away from the heart, the vessel diameter decreases. And then as we move through the veins back towards the heart, the vessel diameter increases again. The smaller the vessel diameter, the greater the resistance to blood flow. So this means that capillaries have the greatest resistance to blood flow. So blood flow is the slowest through capillaries than it is through arteries or veins. Next, let's look at the total cross-sectional area and blood flow velocity. So total cross-sectional area, what this is, is the sum of the lumen diameters of all the vessels of a certain type in the body, okay? The greatest, so let's look at which vessel type has the greatest cross section, total cross-sectional area. Arteries is low, but then once we get towards the capillaries, the total cross-sectional area is very, very high. And then when we get towards the veins, it's low again. This is this means that the total cross-sectional area is greatest in your capillaries. And although your capillaries individually are very small, you have a whole bunch of them. Okay, so if you were actually to take every tiny little capillary and add up its or the area of its uh, lumen, okay, you took that cross-sectional area and you added it up for every single capillary in your body, it would be greater 
than if you added it up for all of the arteries in your body or all of the veins and so forth. If we look at blood flow velocity, this is the rate at which blood is transported. It's greatest in the arteries, then next the veins, and then next the capillaries. Okay, and you can see that by the red line here. Greatest in the arteries, it's really low in the capillaries. That's important. We want blood to flow slowly through the capillaries so there's plenty of time for nutrients and waste and fluid to be exchanged. And then as it goes towards the veins, the velocity starts to speed up again. What factors affect velocity? Well, the greater diameter of the blood vessel, the faster the flow, right? The less resistance. And also the greater the blood pressure, the faster the flow. Arteries are gonna have the greatest, a great diameter, and they're also gonna have the largest blood pressure or the greatest blood pressure, so they're gonna have the fastest flow. Veins have very low blood pressure, but they have great, a greater diameter than the capillaries, and that's why blood flows quicker through them. Capillaries, on the other hand, their blood pressure is relatively slow, uh, or relatively low, and their diameter is extremely, extremely small. So that actually gives them the lowest velocity of blood flow. Now let's talk about blood pressure. Blood pressure, again, is the force that's exerted against the vessel wall. So if you think about it, it's the force of the blood pushing out on the actual vessel walls. Now, if we look at this graph here, we can see, look, see the systemic blood pressure over here on the y-axis, and over here is showing the different vessel types. The arteries have the greatest blood pressure or experience the greatest blood pressure. And then the capillaries would be next. And you can see the veins have the lowest amount of blood pressure. You see this slight fluctuation here because of that cardiac suction that I was talking about before. Notice though that the blood pressure in the arteries is pulsating, going up and down. And that is because every time the heart contracts, it increases the blood pressure in the arteries and when the heart relaxes, it goes down a little bit. Contracts, relaxes, contracts, relaxes. As you move further away from the heart, you don't see that fluctuation anymore. Okay, so once we get to the capillaries, there's no really pulsating of blood pressure. And then within the veins, you don't see you know, any of that up and down type of thing. Because veins have a lower blood pressure, have thinner walls, and they contain a larger volume of blood, they are ideal for withdrawing blood. So whenever you get blood drawn, it's taken from the veins because of those characteristics. This table summarizes the differences between the arteries, veins, and capillaries and is a great table to study. So let's see if you can summarize the di these differences with me. So which vessel type has the greatest volume of blood in a, at a given time and which has the least volume of blood at a given time? The veins have the highest volume of blood at any given time, and this is why they're called the blood reservoirs. The capillaries have the lowest volume of blood at any given time. Which vessel type has the smallest diameter? That would be the capillaries. The arteries in the veins, they vary in their diameter depending on how close or far they are from the heart, but they're always gonna have a greater diameter than the capillaries. Which vessel type has the greatest total cross-sectional area? That would be the capillaries. Again, although you have, although capillaries are very small in their cross-sectional area for each individual capillaries, you have so many capillaries that if you added it all up, it would be really high. Which of the blood vessels has the slowest velocity of blood and which has the greatest velocity of blood. Arteries have the fastest velocity of blood because they experience the greatest amount of blood pressure. They also have a pretty large diameter. 
capillaries have the lowest velocity of blood and that has a lot to do with the fact that they have the smallest diameter which creates a lot of resistance to blood flow. Which blood vessel type has the highest blood pressure and which has the lowest blood pressure. So arteries actually have the highest blood pressure and it's pulsating. So large arteries average between 90 to 100 millimeters of mercury of pressure. The lowest blood pressure would be found in the large veins um, and that would average around 10 millimeters of mercury. And capillaries also have a low blood pressure within them. The blood pressure in capillaries is a little higher than in veins, though, because capillaries are closer to the heart. Um, and they, uh, the blood pressure ranges between 20 and 40. You don't have to memorize the actual blood pressure numbers for those. Um, what about valves being present to prevent backflow? Are they present in arteries, veins? capillaries? Well, they're only present in the veins because again, that has to do with the fact that veins have the lowest blood pressure, so they need these valves to prevent the blood from going the wrong direction. And let's look at resistance. So this is the friction kind of created that prevents blood flow. Um, remember, resistance to flow increases as the diameter of vessels decreases. So which of these vessel types would have the greatest resistance to blood flow? That would be the capillaries because they have the smallest diameter. All right, so this is some good practice to make sure that you can differentiate between the different vessel types. So which vessel type experiences the greatest blood pressure? That would be the arteries. Which experiences the lowest blood pressure? That would be the veins because they're the farthest from the heart. Um, blood pressure in these vessels is pulsating. That would be the arteries. Uh, these vessels display the greatest resistance to flow. So that would be the one that has the smallest diameter. So that would be the capillaries. This has the slowest velocity of blood flow. Again, that would be the capillaries, and that's going to be important because we need blood to move slowly through the capillaries to give time for exchange to happen. This vessel type may contain valves to prevent backflow of blood. That's only in your veins, and again, that's only usually in the larger veins um, and the ones that are below or inferior to your um, heart. Uh, this vessel type has the highest total cross-sectional area. That would be the capillaries. This vessel type has the smallest diameter. That would be the capillaries. This vessel type is surrounded only by endothelial cells and a basement membrane. Do you remember? That would be the capillaries again. Uh, this vessel type has a very thick tunica media consisting of smooth muscles. That would be the arteries, because arteries have to, you know, alter their diameter a lot, especially to compensate for changes in blood pressure. Um, this is this blood vessel type. It has a, its thickest layer is the tunica externa. That would be the veins, and this is where fluid and molecules are exchanged between the blood and the interstitial space. That would be the capillaries. The last major topic I want to talk about in this chapter is how our bodies monitor and regulate our blood pressure and also how blood pressure is typically measured. So we have already talked about this before. Blood pressure is monitored by baroreceptors found in the carotid arteries, which are again the arteries that are supplying blood to your neck and your head. You also have baroreceptors located in your aortic arch. An increase in blood pressure would signal your autonomic nervous system to do two things to try to lower your blood pressure. One is it's going to reduce your heart rate so that there's less blood being pumped through your vessels. And second, it's going to increase the vasodilation of your blood pressure. So remember, reducing heart rate 
reducing your heart rate decreases cardiac output, therefore lowers blood pressure. Increasing the vessel diameter lowers the resistance to flow, and therefore that lowers your blood pressure as well. So how can we measure our blood pressure? So blood pressure is typically measured in your arteries and arterial blood pressure therefore is the pressure of blood flowing through the arteries of the systemic circulation. And whenever you measure blood pressure, you usually have two numbers, right? So it's reported as two different pressures. Um, the top number or the higher number is called the systolic pressure because that's the pressure in your arteries when the ventricles are contracting. The bottom number, which is usually around 80, is your diastolic pressure because that is the pressure in um, the arteries when the ventricles are relaxed. So if you remember, systole means contraction, diastole means relaxation. So you get have the systolic pressure over the diastolic pressure. One important clinical application associated with this is hypertension. And this is chronically elevated blood pressure. Uh, so this is usually when the systolic pressure is over 140 and the diastolic pressure is over 90. This is known as a silent killer. And that's usually because there's no really obvious symptoms to having hypertension a lot of times. You won't even notice that your blood pressure is really high. Um, and the problem with that though is that can put extra strain on your heart, that can put extra strain on your blood vessels, so that can actually result in weakening of your blood vessels because of the extra pressure that's put on them. So how do you measure blood pressure? Well, there's a couple things you're gonna need. One is the brachial artery, which is running down the front of your arm here. And you'll also need a sphygmomanometer which is a device that can uh, measure the blood pressure and a stethoscope that allows you to listen to the blood moving through the blood vessels. The first step in measuring arterial blood pressure is to place the stethoscope on the brachial artery and to wrap the cuff around the arm just above the elbow. Then you want to use the little pump thing here and you're gonna increase the pressure in the cuff so it's above 120 and you shouldn't be able to hear any sounds to the stethoscope. And that is because you're completely blocking the, the artery, blood flow through the artery. The second thing you're gonna do is then continually lower the pressure, and eventually you should start hearing a knocking sound, like a tch, 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 tch. And that sound is actually the blood flowing through the vessel as it's slowly opening up. And when you, right as soon as you start hearing that sound, that is called the systolic pressure. So that's that higher number, which is usually around 120 or so. The last step to measuring blood pressure is to continually lower the pressure until eventually the arteries completely open. And when it's completely open, you don't hear any sounds of the blood hitting like the artery wall. And so as soon as the sound disappears, that is the second number, the diastolic pressure, and that's usually around 80. Okay, so as you're lowering the pressure in the cuff, the first, when you start hearing a sound, that's the systolic pressure, and then when the sound disappears, that's the diastolic pressure. All right, so here are some blood vessel disorders and their related terminology, and let's just, this is the last thing, just to make sure that you can uh, describe these different disorders. So an elevated blood pressure, what would that be called? It's hypertension. A weakened blood vessel wall that bulges out as, and is in danger of bursting. That would be an aneurysm. When recording blood pressure, this is the higher number. Okay, so if it's 120 over 80, this is the 120. That is a systolic pressure. When recording blood pressure, this is the lower number. So that would, if it's 120 over 80, that would be the 80. That would be the diastolic pressure, the amount of the pressure in the arteries when the ventricles are relaxed. When the valves in the veins become non-functional because the veins have been stretched too much, what do we call that or what does that form? That forms varicose veins. 
And this is a disease where the arteries narrow due to a buildup of plaque. That is atherosclerosis. All right, so that is the end of the blood vessel chapter. If you have any questions, please reach out to me and let me know.